Thank you very much, Guy, and it's terrific to be here. As I was uh, getting set up here, uh, and I was being shown this this podium, which um, I'm I'm delighted to tell you, it turns out to be a ballistic resistant podium. Um, so, and I said I said, well, you know, I've spoken to some unfriendly audiences, but I thought this was more of a friendly one. But just in case, it's good to know that if I have to, I can just duck down and be completely safe. Um, Guy said uh, at that I'm a law professor, that that is in fact the one thing I do that pays me. Um, all these other things which, which sound like fun and are fun, and of course the, because they're fun, they're not the things that pay me. Um, and because I'm a law professor, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the book I just wrote, uh, which is out there, How Everything Became War and the Military Became Everything. Uh, because I'm a law professor, one of the major themes of that book is, is law related. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the law, but not too much because uh, my publisher told me not to. Um, this was one of those experiences where you realize exactly how different New York and Washington are and exactly how different legal academia and New York publishing are. Uh, I went into New York uh, to meet with the publisher and the publisher's publicity team uh, before the book came out and, and the president of the publishing company said to me, I love your book. I just love your book. Uh, the only thing I'm thinking, could you maybe cut some of that law stuff? <laughs> and I said, well, um, <laughs> not really. Uh, and then he said, and your biography is so interesting and so compelling, all these interesting things you've done. But I think the whole thing about being a law professor, I'm worried that every time we use the phrase law professor, we will sell five fewer copies. <laughs> um, and I, I said, it's just a hobby. Um, but uh, it, there is indeed a little tiny bit of law, but I'm going to try not to make it be, be too painful. Um, let me start out, though, by, by, by telling a, a story. And uh, those of you who know a little bit about my background um, uh, will realize this is not, was not completely a foregone conclusion that I was going to end up growing up and working at the Pentagon or marrying an Army officer. Uh, I come from a very left-wing family. Uh, my parents were anti-war activists during the Vietnam War. One of my earliest memories is sitting on a blanket, picnic blanket in Central Park in 1974, uh, celebrating the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, I remember protesting with a hearty group of peace activists in our neighborhood. The uh, requirement reintroduced under Ronald Reagan that uh, Americans register for the draft, and we stood there with our little homemade signs, and everybody ignored us, and we stood there anyway. Uh, and uh, uh, I think my mother was probably uh, last at the Pentagon in the 1960s trying to levitate the building. Um, so it won't surprise you that when I got a job at the Pentagon, it actually took me a few weeks to work up the courage to even tell my mother. Um, I was afraid she would disown me or something. Um, but I finally did, and she sort of, oh, well. I think the only way she could really make any sense of this was that I was undercover. Um, um, and so after a, a, a few months at the Pentagon uh, working for Michelle Flournoy, um, I, I invited her to come for lunch. She, she just lives in Alexandria a few miles away from me. And so she, she rather uh, anxiously you know, said, all right, all right. And so we got her through security. And you know, she came to the metro entrance. and going up the escalator and we're going through the corridors and we walk past the florist and we walk past the CVS and we walk past the market basket shop and we walk past the chocolate shop and we walk past the ATM and the barber shop and the sign for the Starbucks and, and suddenly my mother just stopped short in the middle of the corridor and this is not a good thing to do as you know in the corridor of the Pentagon because you just get run over um, but so people are kind of irritably steering their way around us and, and I stopped too and I say mom what's the matter and she's She's looking around, and, and she says, are you telling me that the heart of American military power is a shopping mall? <laughs> um, I said, pretty much. You know, she wasn't, <laughs> she wasn't far wrong, obviously. Um, uh, I believe the Pentagon still boasts the status of being the world's largest office building. It's got, uh, according to the Pentagon uh, <laughs> tour website, at least, 17.5 miles of corridors, uh, 23,000 employees, civilian and military alike. Uh, and needless to say, over the years, as, as I think you all have seen, uh, the Pentagon's 17.5 miles of corridors have sprouted uh, dozens of shops and restaurants catering to the building's 23,000 employees. And over time, uh, I think it's probably fair to say that the US military itself 
has in many ways come to offer a similar kind of one-stop shopping experience for the nation's top policymakers. Uh, at the Pentagon, uh, this leads to all these slightly surreal juxtapositions. You can now uh, buy a new pair of running shoes if you need them at the Pentagon. There's, it's, it's tucked away kind of far away in a, in a basement somewhere, but there is a running store uh, at the Pentagon. You can buy a new pair of running shoes or you can order a, a marine expeditionary unit to patrol in the Philippines. You can, you know, if you're not feeling too good, you can get some Tylenol or some Imodium at the CVS uh, or you can order a team of army medics to fight malaria in Chad. You can buy a new cell phone. If you lose yours, you can get a cheap one. Uh, or you can task the NSA, if you're sufficiently senior, with monitoring somebody else's cell phone. Um, and you can, of course, uh, everybody's favorite, you can purchase a small fighter jet made out of chocolate um, at the chocolate store. Um, you, can all, you can get all sorts of cool things made out of chocolate at that store. Um, all sorts of really quite surprising things made out of chocolate. Uh, or you can, uh, if you don't like your, your chocolate fighter jet, you can order up a drone strike in, in Yemen or, or <laughs> Libya or somewhere else. So you name it, the Pentagon uh, at this point has come to supply it. Uh, 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 General Dave Barno once said to me, and I, I love to quote him, uh, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, a, I'm like his agent uh, on this. He said, you know, the, the, the military is becoming a super Walmart with everything under one roof. And we've now seen several successive presidential administrations that have been eager consumers. How should we feel about this? Uh, needless to say, I think the, the US military's transformation into the world's biggest one-stop shopping outfit uh, isn't necessarily a cause for celebration. Um, but I think it is both the product and the driver of really seismic changes in how Americans and particularly American elites and policymakers have come to think about uh, war with subsequently challenge, subsequent challenges to how we think about our laws and how we think about the military as an institution itself. Uh, and indeed, to somewhat oversimplify, uh, I think you could say that we are we are stuck in something of a, a vicious circle at this point. Um, we have gotten into the habit, particularly since 9-11, uh, now some almost, what, 16 years ago, of viewing every new threat through the lens of war and asking our military in consequence to take on an ever-expanding range of non-traditional tasks but as we view and view more and more threats as war, and you, you know, here I'm talking about things like threats from geographically diffused non-state terror networks, threats from cyberspace, threats that emanate from everything from poverty, climate change, political repression, uh, economic instability, you name it, the more we view emerging threats through the lens of war, uh, the more, and the more we view them as tasks for the military, the more we also tend to bring more and more spheres of human activity into the ambit of the law of war. And I'll talk much more about that in a few minutes. Uh, uh, and meanwhile, asking the military to take on more and more kinds of different kinds of tasks means that we have to have higher military budgets, uh, which in turn means that we have to look for savings elsewhere. We have to think about freezing or cutting the budgets of civilian uh, government agencies that traditionally work on diplomacy, development, and so forth as budget cuts and freezes cripple those agencies, their capabilities dwindle, we look to the military to pick up the slack and that circle continues, needless to say. It's the, you know, the old adage, the old cliche, if your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, uh, applies here as well. If your only functioning government institution is the military, everything looks like a war and, every, and war rules begin to seem to apply to everything, displacing peacetime law and norms. Uh, and when everything looks like a war, everything looks like a military mission, uh, including, which displaces civilian institutions and undermines their credibility even as we overload the military. So who cares? Why should we care about any of this? Um, well, the book really has two interwoven themes, uh, and one strand to my publisher's permanent dismay is very much a strand that has to do with law and the rule of law uh, and the impact of all this on the rule of law, uh, and the other strand uh, is about the impact of all this on the military as an institution uh, and on how we think about the military and its role. 
Um, let me start by talking a little bit about that first theme, the law theme, because I can't help it. Um, as a law professor, I just, I just can't stop myself. Um, here's the thing, right? I'll start by saying something so obvious that I think we forget it, right? When we, when we decide that we're going to think of something through the lens of war, that has consequences. It's not just a speech act. It's not just rhetoric. It's not just metaphor. It also has consequences that are political, and it has consequences that are legal. Uh, uh, when we call something a war, we bring it into a body of law that is quite different in very fundamental ways than ordinary peacetime law. Um, but, but let me take an even, even a step back from that and start with something, again, that's sort of so obvious that we don't even think about it, which is that in war, we expect warriors to act in ways that are completely different than we expect people to act during peacetime. You know the famous lines from uh, Shakespeare's Henry V in peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility, but when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger, stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard favored rage. You know, that's kind of a fancy way of saying it, right? But but uh, in wartime, you get to kill people. You have to kill people. You're supposed to kill people uh, and do all sorts of other unpleasant things that ordinarily we think, oh, that, that's, that's no good. Uh, in peacetime, the very same things that we, we give people medals for during wartime, we consider to be immoral and illegal. Um, we, we expect you in time of war. If you are a warrior in a time of war, we expect you, we require, we may even punish you if you fail to act in a way that we wouldn't tolerate in peacetime, we'd regard as immoral. Um, and we tolerate that, of course. We tolerate, we expect different behavior, activities that we regard as immoral in peacetime, we give medals for in wartime, because we view war as temporary. We view war as bounded. We think of war as an exception, uh, not as the norm, and we're willing to say, hey, look, you know, wars happen, bad things happen, and partly because we want them to be short, we're going to tolerate all these things during wartime that are completely unacceptable in peacetime. Um, but that's OK, because wars are going to begin, they're going to end. We've got a nice, we can draw nice, nice lines around them. And we can keep that behavior sort of cordoned off during wartime and not have it bleed into anything else, because we assume wars are really distinct and easy to distinguish from peace. Um, the problem, of course, is that when you get into the era in which we are, we are all living, uh, and the boundaries around war get blurrier and blurrier, when it becomes harder and harder to say with any clarity what counts as a war, what we should think of as a war, institutionally, politically, and legally speaking, uh, it consequently gets harder and harder to decide at the most basic level what kinds of actions should be praised and what should be condemned. Um, for me, one of the most fun parts of researching this book, um, I, I, I got a degree in anthropology before I went to law school, and I delved into sort of how other human societies at different times have thought about war, and that, that was really fun. Um, but I can tell you that essentially every single human society that I am aware of throughout history has, for that very reason, tried to draw really sharp lines between war and not war. Warriors, not warriors, um, and between you know between the role of the warrior and the role of the civilian. Uh, until less than a century ago, as as you know, most Western societies insisted that wars should be formally declared, should take place on clearly delineated battlefields, be fought by uniformed soldiers operating within specialized hierarchical military organizations. Uh, in different earlier times, uh, human societies developed other kinds of rituals to to delineate the boundaries of war uh, from elaborate war painting and war drums and other kinds of rituals, war sorcery to war, war paint complex initiation rites for warriors before they went into battle and when they returned from battle, all designed to be able to sort of draw a really sharp line. War, not war. Exception, norm. Uh, and I'll give you a few of my favorite examples uh, from the anthropological literature. One, uh, the Old Norse berserkers who gave us our modern word berserk were warriors who, before they went into battle, they would, uh, they would don the pelts of wild animals, of wolves and bears, um, 
and they believe that when they put on the skins of these predatory wild animals that they would literally become these animals and take on their attributes, that they would have a, a courage and a brutality in, in battle that humans ordinarily did not and indeed should not have. Uh, and their behavior in combat was indeed so so violent and, and uh, brutal that the word berserk persists today. Uh, among the Navajo Indians of the American Southwest, um, they literally had a different dialect for wartime and peace. When, the, when Navajo warriors went out on a raid, they would assume a different dialect with different verb forms, different vocabulary. They would go off to the raid. They would come back from the raid, presumably victorious. Uh, uh, I don't think you tended to come back if you weren't victorious in those, in those days. Uh, they would come back. They would draw a line in the desert sand. Uh, they would stand on the side of the enemy, facing the enemy's territory, uh, and then they would step back over the line towards on the side of their home territory, at which point they would resume speaking the, the ordinary language of peace. Um, many, many, many Native American groups uh, actually changed the locus of government authority, depending on whether it was wartime or peacetime. They'd literally have a war chief and a peace chief. Uh, and the peace chief was usually hereditary, in nature uh, and was in charge most of the time. Uh, but in time of serious and sustained conflict, they would switch over to a war chief uh, who was usually chosen based on merit rather than uh, hereditary attributes. Um, so depending on whether you were at war or not, literally who was in charge in your form of governance changed uh, from one, one person to another, one form of government to another. And one, one final example I'll give uh, comes from another different part of the world. Uh, uh, Polynesia, where the Makao Indians uh, had elaborate rituals to prepare men to go into battle. Um, it, for months prior to battle, uh, they would have to um, go through various rituals with their other preparing warriors. Um, they would sing certain songs. They would wear certain skins uh, and fetishes and certain kinds of paint on their bodies. Um, and they also had to abstain both from certain food and drink and from any kind of sexual relations with their spouses while they were preparing to go into battle. And that was necessary to create the, the war sorcery that would enable them to prevail. And when they returned home at the end of the war, uh, they had to do the same thing again. They had to again refrain from sexual relations with their spouses uh, for some weeks or months because the Mikhail believed that if they didn't do that, uh, if they had intercourse with their wives while the war sorcery remained, in the, remained on their skin, that the war sorcery would enter both of their bodies and kill both the man and the woman. And war was seen literally as, as toxic to ordinary community and ordinary life and love and relationships uh, and had to be kept distinct. We're, no, we're, we're not actually all that different, right, in our cultural beliefs. Um, and uh, I'm thinking that many of you here have uh, been through one form or another or, of uh, uh, basic training. Uh, uh, and you will remember that we, we shear off the hair of our recruits. We take away their clothing. We replace it with uniform so that they will look uniform and not like uh, their old selves. We, we give them special symbols to display on their chest. We force them to engage in, in carefully choreographed, ritualized dance ceremonies. We call it drill, uh, uh, which have no practical purpose these days anymore, any more than the ritual war dances of many a primitive tribe. Uh, but we do it anyway because we believe it transforms them in some fundamental way out of their civilian identity into their warrior identity. Uh, and just like so many uh, human societies and tribes that went before us, uh, we too name our weapons and so on after, uh, and our units for our, our totem animals and spirits, uh, the predator, the hornet, the black hawk, the reaper, uh, just like the berserkers, presumably imagining that this will give us some sort of special power when it comes to actual combat. Uh, and I think despite the changes ushered in by the 9-11 attacks, most Americans certainly still prefer to view war as a sphere that is separate and distinct from ordinary life and from peacetime, a sphere that should not interfere uh, 
or intrude into our everyday world of shopping malls, offices, schools, soccer games, and we relegate war to the military, uh, a distinct social institution that we both lionize and ignore. Uh, we like to think of war still as an easily recognizable exception to the normal state of affairs, and we think of the military as an institution that can be easily, if somewhat tautologically, defined by its specialized war-related functions. War is what the military does. The military is the institution that does war. And that's pretty much the end of our analysis quite a lot of the time. The problem, uh, as you all know, uh, is that in this world rife with transnational terror networks, with cyber threats, with disruptive non-state actors, uh, that's not true anymore. We just can't keep those things in their little boxes. And our traditional categories, war, peace, military and civilian, are becoming, I think, almost useless. Um, in a cyber war, a war on terrorism, there can't be any boundaries in time or in space. We can't point to a battlefield on a map or articulate circumstances in which it makes even any sense to think of a war ending. We aren't sure what counts as a weapon anymore on 9-11. Of course, the weapons were passenger planes and box cutters. Uh, we've seen that uh, perhaps a line of malicious computer code is a weapon, a, a van, a knife. Uh, who knows what counts as a weapon or what could become a weapon, a bioengineered virus, uh, propaganda that spreads. We can't even define the enemy. Uh, I would, I would challenge anyone to clarify for me exactly who the enemy is in Syria uh, at this moment, for instance. I'm not entirely sure that, that even, uh, even the folks who are uh, put in the rather difficult position of having to decide where we're going to drop munitions in the Pentagon right now are quite sure who the enemy is or why they're the enemy and not somebody else or what we're doing. Um, and we've also lost any coherent basis, I think, more and more for distinguishing between combatants and civilians or for, between those who are targetable, uh, legally speaking, and those who are not. Uh, is, a, is a Russian hacker a combatant or a Chinese hacker or a North Korean hacker? Uh, what about a financier for al-Shabaab in Somalia or a Pakistani teenager who shares extremist propaganda or a Russian engineer paid by ISIS to operate captured Iraqi oil fields? Uh, uh, or the guy who recruits people in France or in England uh, to do attacks. Are they combatants? Are they targetable? Are they warriors? Or are they civilians? I think we are finding it harder and harder to draw any clear lines. And let me go back to the law part and what's at stake here. Again, to say something kind of obvious, when there's a war, the law of war applies. Uh, and the law of war gives states and their agents enormous latitude when it comes to using lethal force and other for forms of coercion. Uh, when you're in a war, it's okay for the state to censor your communications, it's okay for the state to monitor your communications, it's okay for the state to detain people not because they've been put through a trial and they committed a crime, but simply in order to keep them off the battlefield and away from mischief. Uh, it's okay for the state to kill people without due process when we're in a war. When we're not in a war, the law emphasizes individual rights, due process, and restrictions on the power of the state to do all of those things. You know, you got to go to court, you got to get a warrant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so peacetime law and wartime law are, are in some ways really opposites. When we lose the ability to draw clear, consistent distinctions between war and not war, we also lose any principled basis for making some of the most vital decisions that a democracy can make. Uh, we lose the ability to make a principled decision. We can still make decisions. We're just going to be making arbitrary decisions. We lose the ability to make principled decisions about what matters, if any, should be beyond the scope of judicial review versus which matters are appropriately for the courts to decide. We lose the ability to make principled decisions about when a government can have secret laws and when a government's legal analysis must be made public and be open and transparent. Uh, we lose the ability to decide when a state can monitor its, its citizens' communications, uh, to decide who should be imprisoned, under what circumstances, and with what degree, if any, of due process. Uh, and we lose the ability to decide where, when, and against whom can we use lethal force? And, and to, make it, to make it really concrete, you know, think about drone strikes. Uh, 
been very controversial. Um, and obviously, you know, the issue is not the, the drone, um, but uh, what we might call targeted strikes outside of so-called hot battlefields, areas of active conflict. Um, when we're thinking of a U.S. targeted strike in, in Yemen uh, or Pakistan or Somalia or anywhere else, um, if we think that the person we are targeting, if we think that there's a war going on, uh, legally speaking, uh, and we think that the person we're targeting is either an enemy combatant in that war or is a civilian engaging directly in hostilities and therefore targetable in that war, um, we, but of course, we have to know what a war is. We have to know where the war is. We have to know where the boundaries around the war is. We have to know what it means to be a combatant. We have to know if it's a civilian, what it means to participate in hostilities. Um, so if we think, however, that, that there is all those things, yes, war, yes, combatant, et cetera, uh, then the U.S. targeting of that person uh, for death, uh, whether by drone strike or special operations raid or and, you know, poking them with a poison umbrella, it doesn't really matter. Uh, if we think there's a war and they're a combatant, then that is morally and legally identical to a U.S. service member on D-Day uh, who fires at a German machine gunner. They're just, they're identical morally and they're identical legally. Um, on the other hand, if we think, wait a second, we're not so sure there's a war, or we think there is a war, but we're not sure the war is there, or we think there is a war, but and it might even be there, but we're not sure that that person is a combatant in the war or participating in hostilities in that war. If we're not sure about those things, then, it's, then, then the U.S. is going around the world and it is murdering people. And that's not good. And we really want to know the difference, right? We really, really want to feel confident that we are on the right side of that line and not the wrong side of that line. Um, uh, but the trouble is, I think, when we, when we expand what we label war, when what we label war starts to blur, uh, and, I think it, and I think it has blurred, and I think it has blurred not because there's a conspiracy out there, I and mean, there are a few conspiracies out there, but I don't think that's the reason it blurred. Um, you know, it's blurred because the threat environment has changed. It's blurred because fewer and fewer scenarios fit into these nice little categories that we created, and I think it's, it's always worth emphasizing that these particular categories and the rules associated with them, I'll come back to this in, in, in the moment, uh, you know, God didn't write them on the stone tablet. You know, humans made them up, and we made them up at a specific historical moment. Essentially, uh, they emerge in the late 19th century and are sort of solidified in the decades immediately after World War II. We, made, we come up with them at a particular historical moment to achieve particular normative purposes, particular outcomes. Um, and more and more these days, it turns out that the world doesn't choose to fit into these nice little categories we've made, but we are very, very reluctant to let go of them. Um, um, the trouble is, of course, uh, at, as I said, we can no longer, they're not useful anymore. They don't help us anymore. They don't help us legally. They don't help us morally. Uh, it is now possible, it is now well, and, uh, well, ask me, ask me in the questions and answers if you're interested about the one and only illustration in my book, and I'll tell you about it, but maybe I won't go there right this second. Um, uh, but really, we, you know, the law can no longer answer any of our important questions and can no longer offer us much guidance, and that's not a good place for a rule of law-oriented democracy to be. Um, this also has institutional consequences. Um, and as I said, there's a, two main themes of the book. One is what this blurring of the boundaries around war does to the rule of law, and the other is what does it do to our ability to make sense of what we want our institutions to do. When we expand what we label war, we also lose our ability to make sound decisions about which tasks we should assign to the military and which tasks should be left to civilians. Uh, so as you know, uh, at this point, we have American military personnel operating in almost every country on Earth, not quite every country, but awfully close. Uh, and not only are they operating in almost every country on Earth, but they are doing uh, almost every job on Earth at this point. Uh, they are launching raids and agricultural reform projects. They are planning airstrikes and planning small business development initiatives. They are training parliamentarians. They are producing TV soap operas. They're patrolling for pirates, monitoring global email communications, designing programs to prevent human trafficking, and they are vaccinating a surprisingly high number of cattle around the world, um, which is good, a good thing to do. Um, but needless to say, it does raise some questions about, well, what is this thing we call the military? 
uh, at this point in time? What's it for? Uh, do we know what it's for anymore? How, and, and on what basis do we think we know what it's for? Um, long, long time ago when I was in law school, um, I applied for a management consulting job at McKinsey and Company, the big management consulting firm. and. Uh, they used to do, and I'm sure they probably still do their interviews as they put you through the series of interviews where you're confronted with these hypothetical scenarios and you're supposed to give, I guess, the management consultant answer uh, in these scenarios or show you can think like a management consultant. Uh, and I do remember one of the scenarios that I got when I was interviewing was um, the interviewer said, you know, you operate a little mom and pop general store and business is going great. But then one day you hear that Walmart is opening up uh, you know, down the block from you, what do you do? And I said, you know, <laughs> roll over and die. Um, <laughs> which uh, I think was the wrong answer from a, <laughs> from a management consulting perspective. I think I was supposed to say something like, you know, I will brew artisanal Aztec chocolate lattes and I will develop a niche, right? And, and, but, but of course we all know that realistically speaking, um, the odds would have been against my little mom and pop store when, when Walmart shows, shows up. Uh, the writing is pretty much on the wall. Uh, I think it's fair to say that like Walmart, today's military can marshal vast resources and exploit economies of scale in ways that are impossible for small mom and pop operations. And like Walmart, the tempting one-stop shopping that is offered by the US military increasingly uh, is having a devastating effect on smaller, more traditional enterprises, in this case, the State Department, uh, USAID, and, and other civilian parts of our foreign policy apparatus, uh, which are steadily shrinking into irrelevance in our ever more militarized world, a trend that appears uh, only to be accelerating in the current administration quite, quite dramatically, indeed more dramatically than, than I think anyone would have uh, imagined if, uh, given the President's budget proposal. Um, the Pentagon, needless to say, isn't necessarily as good at promoting agricultural or economic reform as the State Department or USAID. Uh, sometimes it's actually significantly worse because it's not what people train for by and large. Um, but unlike our civilian government agencies, the US military has millions of employees uh, who are willing to work insane hours in terrible conditions, and it's an outfit that is open 24-7. Needless to say, it's also fashionable to, to hate Walmart, right? Nobody wants to admit that they like it. Uh, it's cheap, it's sort of yucky and tacky, and its buildings are ugly, and we don't think it probably doesn't treat people all that well, and so we like to exile it to the uh, uh, you know, outside of town. We use our zoning laws to make sure we don't actually have to look at it. We can sort of stroll around an old town and so forth and look at you know, cute little boutiques, and Walmart has to go somewhere else, so we don't actually have to see it very often. Um, uh, but much as we resent Walmart, uh, most of us would, of course, be rather hard pressed to live without it. Uh, sooner or later, everybody finds themselves at Walmart just because it's so darn useful. Um, and I think as the US military struggles to define its role and mission, uh, it is evoking similarly contradictory attitudes in the civilian population. And no surprise, right, for the military to be struggling with its role and mission when the next threat could come from anywhere in the world and be anything. Uh, then the temptation, of course, is to do everything and be everywhere. But even an institution as large as the US military can't quite manage that feat of doing everything and being everywhere simultaneously. Uh, so I think it, I, I, I do not envy the senior militaries of military leaders of today who face a, a challenge, a sort of identity challenge that is much more, much deeper in some ways than I think has been faced for many generations. Um, but nonetheless, I think the, 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 heat, the tendency is to sort of keep on adding stuff here and there. You know, well, okay, then we'll go vaccinate cattle, and okay, we'll go fight Ebola, and okay, we'll, you know, you need us to monitor people's cell phones, we can do that too. Uh, whatever it is, you need us. You need us to have special forces. We'll have special forces. You need us to have troops in Afghanistan. We'll have troops in Afghanistan. You need us to fight human trafficking and pirates. We'll do that too. Whatever it is, um, but I do think it evokes kind of contradictory emotions in the civilian populations and from civilian top of civilian policymakers. Uh, I think civilian government officials tend to prefer, needless to say, a military that will provide more but cost less that will stay deferentially out of strategy discussions, uh, but will be eternally available to ride to the rescue 
uh, that will prosecute our ever-expanding and blurring wars without forcing any of us to face the difficult moral or legal questions uh, that are created by the eroding boundaries between war and peace. We want a military that will solve every global problem, but the rest of the time stay safely quarantined on isolated military bases, uh, separated from the rest of us by uh, anachronistic rituals and acres of cultural misunderstanding and barbed wire and guards, bar guard posts. Uh, and indeed, I think it's fair to say that even as the boundaries around war have blurred and the military's activities have expanded, the US military as a human institution has grown more and more sharply delineated from the broader society that it is charged with protecting, uh, uh, leaving fewer and fewer civilians with the knowledge or the confidence to raise questions about how we define war, how we should define war, what it should mean when we define war one way or another, uh, or about how the military as an institution operates. As I said earlier, it's not too late to it's not too late to change this because no divine power handed down these categories that we are that we are operating with. Um, uh, you know, the idea that certain tasks and those tasks only should be done by people wearing uniforms and certain tasks should be done only by people who don't wear uniforms has always struck me as a rather odd one and a relic of a particular moment in American history and a particular legacy. Um, but there's nothing magic, needless to say, about the wearing of a uniform or not. Uh, we imbue this with a sort of ritualized magic. Uh, and I, I think our, our president is a deep believer in the magic that comes with uniforms and stars. Um, and many of the American public are as well. I mean, the, the, the military, as you know, has been one of the, the few US institutions that has escaped the sort of tide of cynicism that has engulfed the American public in many ways. Uh, you know, every year they do those polls looking at confidence in public institutions and the military is usually, you know, more than, more than three quarters of the American public has great confidence in the military and then you start saying things, well, how about the judiciary? And say, like, uh, you know, 55%. How about the president? Oh, 40%. Uh, you know, how about Congress? You know, negative 6%. Um, you know, but, but, but we still regard the military as kind of magic, uh, can fix all of our problems for us. Um, um, but at the same time, we're very, very nervous about what it does, and we get very anxious when we think, well, wait, should the, mil the military can't do that. Um, but needless to say, I think that's actually, that's actually a discussion we should be having, and it's totally tied up with the, you know, what do we think war is? What do we think war is? Uh, what do we think the military should do? The military can do whatever we want it to do. It's a pretty amazing institution, right? And it's, amaz it's, a, it's an institution with a unique ability to marshal human talent. And we can have it do what we want it to do as long as we're willing to accept the consequences, the financial consequences, the cultural consequences, the consequences for how we recruit, how we train, how we equip, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and similarly, there's nothing magic, this category, this counts as a war, that doesn't count as a war, here's what happens in wartime, the opposite happens in peacetime. Those things can all be changed, right? Uh, the, this sort of amazing, period of lawmaking after World War II, um, which led to uh, the expansion of the Geneva Conventions, the codification of human rights law, uh, the emergence of numerous inst international institutions from the United Nations itself to various other sort of ancillary institutions, was an amazing moment of, of sort of human creativity in rule and institution making. But inevitably, like all such human efforts, it was backwards looking. You know, that, that spurt of lawmaking and institution building was designed to prevent the last war, as everything always is, uh, and to prevent something like that from happening again. And it was designed based on the actors and institutions and problems that existed then. Uh, and we've been weirdly, in some ways, this is a whole other subject, again, happy to talk about it later. In some ways, we've been weirdly loyal to this set of laws and institutions, and weirdly reluctant to rethink any of them, even though I, I do believe we have come to a moment at which, as I said, we're still looking to the law to give us answers to questions that the law cannot guide us on. Uh, oh, I, okay, I can't help it. I'm going to talk about my one illustration. Um, <laughs> there, there is one. There's only one illustration in the book, and it's it's a it's 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 a drawing that some of you have probably seen. It's it's a. Uh, uh, it's the duck rabbit, the uh, duck rabbit drawn by the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. 
And it's a little drawing, and, and depending on how you look at it, you think, oh, it's a duck, and then you look at it again, you think, oh, no, wait, that's, that's not a duck bill. Those are rabbit ears. It's a rabbit. For those of you who haven't seen it, you all have seen, I'm sure, the, the optical illusion where is it a vase or is it two profiles looking at each other, right? And Wittgenstein used this little illustration to make a, a point about language and categories and, and the, the ways in which our categories, the language and categories we use are just approximations that we, we create for functional reasons, but they don't necessarily capture truths about reality, right? Uh, and you can look at the duck rabbit uh, forever. And no matter how long you look at it and how hard you study it, it will not reveal itself at some point to be definitively a duck or definitively a rabbit. You know, that there exist things in the world that hop around and things that quack, uh, but this particular drawing, is, it is what it is, and language is never going to capture more about it. And I actually think that we're at the point when it comes to thinking about war and the legal categorization of war or combatants or civilians or hostilities or weapons that is very, very similar. You know, that if you look at, pick any, not any, I mean, there are, you know, to say that there is a lot of gray doesn't mean there isn't some black and some white. There is some black and some white out there, of course. Um, but if you took hypothetically, because they're all classified, but hypothetically, uh, if you took the targets of the various US uh, drone strikes over the last uh, six or seven or eight years, and you looked at any one of them, uh, and I trust me I, when I tell you that you could take 10 lawyers and you could lock them in a room, uh, and you could say to them, come up with definitive agreement on whether this person was a, com a targetable combatant in an armed conflict or not, and the lawyers can't answer that question. It's like the duck rabbit. It doesn't matter how smart they are. It doesn't matter how, how dedicated they are, how experienced they are. The law can't answer that question because of just the thing just doesn't fit in those categories anymore. Um, but we can, of course, change that. We can change those categories. We can change the legal consequences of deciding things are in one category or another. And a lot of the problems that we feel like we face like, oh boy, we're not very comfortable with either something is just like D-Day or it's murder. Those don't seem like the right two choices. Aren't, isn't there anything else? Uh, yes, of course there is. If we're, not, if we're not trapped by this legal and institutional framework that we've inherited, if we're willing to be more creative and consider changing it, you know, I think we can get back to a set of rules and categories that have a much better fit with our basic values. Uh, and indeed, I think that's that's what we we need to do. Uh, it's what we need to do on an institutional level as well. I don't think any senior military leader particularly wants to preside over the Walmartization of the military, uh, particularly when you uh, consider how Walmart looks. You know, the day after the Black Friday sale, <laughs> with nothing left but some you know pieces of junk strewn around the aisles and a whole lot of very demoralized employees. This is not the not the way we want to go. Uh, I think I will stop right there, uh, and I look forward to hearing your your comments and and your questions. So thank you very much. <laughs> Ma'am. Yeah, um, no, and I, I, I talk a little bit in a chapter of the book uh, early on about, about Guantanamo, and, and part of the reason I, I included that chapter um, was that it, it's a way to talk about those early discussions uh, that occur in the, the first few years after the September 11 attacks about, you know, what, what is this thing that just happened? Um, was it a war? Was it an act of war? Was it a crime, a really big crime? Uh, and the ways in which, uh, you know, everything was at stake in that distinction. Um, and the problem, you know, starting right there from the beginning, of course, is that it didn't really fit, it didn't fit our categories. Um, it sort of looked like a war. More people died on September 11th than in the Pearl Harbor attacks. That makes it kind of look like a war. And it was a foreign organization uh, that used words like war. Um, on the other hand, it sort of didn't look like a war. 
It was a group of people who came from many different countries, uh, didn't use traditional weapons, weren't part of a, an organized hierarchy, weren't part of a state's military, didn't have the kind of comprehensible political objectives we associate with, with war. Uh, it looked like a group of criminals who got really, really lucky uh, in some sense. And the decision by the Bush administration to say, um, gee, if I have to put it in box A or box B, I'm going to go with box A, war, made a lot of sense, right? Because if you're the president, and this is why President Obama, despite rhetoric to the contrary, also tended to choose box A. You know, if you're the president and you've got one box in which you get uh, a great deal of latitude to use coercive powers with minimal supervision by the courts or by Congress versus a, a category in which you got everybody looking over your shoulder all the time, you're almost always going to go for box A. The Bush administration went for in a really big way to the point that, that uh, I think they regretted it themselves in this, you know, a few years later uh, and sort of piled so many people into the, you know, the, the sub box that said enemy combatant that it turned out pretty quickly, uh, you know, they were, they were pulling in all kinds of people who shouldn't have been pulled in in the first place, um, creating a dilemma that we, we live with to this day. Uh, and I'm, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot more to say about Guantanamo other than that at this point the problem with Guantanamo is not Guantanamo. You know, the, most of the people who were detained there are, are gone. Um, a, a, a pretty tiny handful have returned to the battlefield, um, but most of them have just gone off to do whatever it is they, they were doing before we detained them. We now have a pretty small collection of people left, under 100, I believe, uh, and about half of those people have been found by the US military to not present any danger. Some of them literally have been found to have just basically been in the wrong place at the wrong time and got swept up, but nobody wants to take them back. We don't know where to put them. Uh, and then we have this very small category of people um, of the Khalid Sheikh Mohammed variety uh, who, you know, we know were really, really bad guys, but for a variety of reasons, including the Bush administration's use of unlawful interrogation methods, we now find that we can't put on trial, but we don't want to let them go, creating a, you know, what do you do uh, problem. I, I actually, happy to talk more about that um, I, 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 have, I have opinions on what we should do, but, but maybe I'll leave it there for now. Sir? Rules of engagement. And the laws are written essentially by lawyers, but they're executed by lieutenants who are providing security on a convoy and fight back the ambush, and they're immediately greeted with a 15-6 investigation after that incident. And it seems to me that's not the intent. Right. And this has gotten out of hand, but I'm curious of your evaluation of rules of engagement and what you think about it. Yeah, I, I think that lawyers love complicated, messy, ambiguous situations in which it's really hard to decide what category somebody falls into, but it's not really fair to be saying to a lieutenant, much less a private, you know, figure it out on the spur of the moment when you're scared out of your mind and somebody's shooting at you. Um, and I do think that the, the further away from black and white our, our categories get, the more we, we do a disservice to uh, people who are out there uh, facing danger because we've created a situation where it is really impossible to know the lawful thing in many, many circumstances. I mean, you know, sometimes it's easy, right? I mean, clearly we do regrettably have service members every now and then who commit things that are egregious crimes, um, but that's the very rare exception. Uh, and I think that the harder situation for a lot of service members is, is that you know, how do you know uh, how to make the right call about whether somebody counts as a civilian or count as targetable under those circumstances? And the answer is, you know, to some extent the answer is, hey, look, it's always been hard. You know, it was hard in Vietnam, it was hard in World War II. Um, but I do think that it's gotten even harder. Uh, and I, I don't think that there, I, I don't think the solution is really a rules of engagement solution. I think it's, it's bigger than that. It's a rethinking of the entire framework of the law of armed conflict, not just a rule, because the rules of engagement reflect the law of armed conflict. And as long as the law of armed conflict doesn't provide clear answers, the rules of engagement are going to be difficult for people to work with in practice. Uh, 
Colonel Didier Gros, French Embassy. Thank you very much for your speech. Um, I haven't read your book, so sorry about my question, but I was wondering if you, in your book, if you uh, have developed this, uh, what strikes me as a key connection between uh, globalization, U.S. leadership, and the state of the U.S. military today. Mm -hmm. To me, I would argue that if you are where you are, one of the reasons is certainly that being the uh, global leader yeah. and seeking dominance, primacy, leadership on everything, anytime, makes it uh, very difficult for the military, like yeah. a few other organizations, but for the military not to do everything, anytime, anywhere. So what do you think uh, about that? And I would even argue that that goes back to the end of uh, World War II. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and since we are the 6th of June, I was thinking, listening to you about uh, Eisenhower, who talked about you know, the risk of this yeah. rising uh, military industrial complex. So do you see connections there? You, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I would. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right that uh, the, the dilemmas the U.S. faces arise in substantial part out of a decision to view ourselves as responsible, both responsible for everything that happens around the globe and potentially at risk from everything happens around the globe. Um, that being said, uh, we, we are at risk from everything that happens around the globe at this point. The, sort of whether those earlier decisions were right or not, now we're stuck with it. Um, we are a target. Uh, as frankly, you know, as we've seen in, in recent years, I think uh, all Western states are now targets uh, around the globe. And are, uh, I think the, the, the thing that is hardest to wrestle with, and this, this is um, something that I think the U.S. is particularly uncomfortable with, um, uh, I do think that there is a, a profound link between a lot of these rule of law issues and global governance issues. Um, that part, you know, part of the reason that we're at risk around the globe is because we act around the globe and we, we, we project force around the globe. Um, part of the reason that we are at risk is that our credibility has, has been diminished uh, by things like the Iraq invasion, uh, and by things like drone strikes, I think, have diminished our credibility because they inevitably, given this blurriness, look arbitrary. You know, even if we think, well, we're doing our best and we're all very good people and we're all very honest, they still look arbitrary because at the end of the day, what we are saying to the rest of the world is, yes, we have to go around and kill people in multiple countries uh, based on uh, evidence uh, that we can't share with you. Um, for reasons and based on legal analysis that we also won't share with you. Um, but you just have to trust us that we did it for the right reasons. And that's not a great place to be if you're a democracy that is dedicated to the rule of law. Uh, even if it's all true, it's not a good place to be. Um, it's not a good place to be because it inspires other countries to say the same thing uh, even while they're not doing the right thing. Uh, and it's not a good place to be because you know this is this is why this is why our forebears uh, rebelled against the against King George. Uh, you know that when you read the nobody ever reads the Declaration of Independence beyond the first couple paragraphs, right? But when you actually get to that Bill of Particulars against King George, um, it's it's about it's about government secrecy. It's about the government use of force without accountability. Uh, it's about uh, rules that. It, it's about having, you know, we rebelled because we said we want a government of laws, not of men. We don't want to be dependent on the goodwill of any leader. We want the laws to apply equally. And we have now, I think, created a system where we're saying to the world, uh, we don't need good laws because we've got good people. We don't need to be transparent. You should just trust us. And, and as I said, that's a terrible place to be, and I, I don't think the world is particularly inclined to trust us uh, anymore, uh, certainly not uh, given, given this administration's attitude towards many of those global institutions that the U.S. was such a part of and helped create and helped create for its own benefit in many ways. And as the, as the only sort of long-term solution to some of those things, and I, I don't have the faintest idea how we're going to get there, right? Um, I do think that there are all kinds of ways in which the global 
institutions and rules that came out of that post-World War II moment are crumbling, uh, but we don't know what to replace them with. Um, everything about the world we live in, I think, is sort of calling for, crying out for more collective decision making and reduced emphasis on sovereignty. Um, you know, whether you want to think about climate change or whether you want to think about global terrorism, no state for, for technological reasons, no state has the autonomy it once had, no state has the ability to go it alone anymore, no state, no matter how powerful, including the United States, no state has the ability to, to do that which means that our dependence from a, from a practical standpoint, U.S. dependence on, on allies and partners around the globe is, is in, dramatically increased. Uh, we don't seem to have any political ability at this moment in time to either recognize that or act on it. Indeed, we seem to be doing the opposite. Um, but, but in the long term, you know, I think that not only is the U.S. Uh, in, in enormous peril if it cannot find ways to develop and be part of an international order that is not so premised on U.S. dominance. Um, you know, I think, but I also think that the, the, the rest of the world is at substantial risk if collectively we can't do that because problems like the conflicts that will stem from climate change in the, in the decades to come, they won't be confined to any one country. Uh, one of the areas that have, has been contentious and difficult to control has been our borders, particularly our southern borders. What would happen if the uh, president signed the Marine Corps to secure our southern land border? The legal implications of that? Uh, good question. I don't know the answer, to be honest. Um, um, I mean, obviously. Uh, well, they, they do that very well. They, they oh, yeah. Solve the right. From a from a from a practical perspective, if you want to put a U.S. Marine every five feet along the border, um, not a lot of people are going to be getting across anymore. Um, from a from a legal perspective, um, I'm a lawyer. There are loopholes. Could you do it in a crisis? Yes, of course you could. Uh, what are the legal impediments? The legal, you know, there really aren't any legal impediments to doing it. Posse comitatus is law enforcement. Um, that posse comitatus would not prevent using Marines for border control. Um, I don't think there. I, you know, I think that there would be legal challenges, but if, but, but not any insuperable legal impediments. Whether it's a good idea is another is another story. But, but I don't. You know, we've already we've already used uh, U.S. troops to some extent in a limited role along the border. Uh, I don't think there's any hard legal barrier to doing it. Although, as I said, I think there are some, some other reasons why we might decide it's not, why I hope we will decide. Uh, oh, well, that's another, maybe we should talk about that uh, at the reception. Um, but but uh, I, think, I think they would range from financial to needing the, needing the, Marines, needing the Marines elsewhere to thinking that uh, closing the border is not really going to solve any of our problems. Yeah, we, we can talk. Uh, Professor Brooks, to your point about what the military could be doing or should be doing versus what the civilians should be doing, uh, it occurs to me that there's an enormity of scale situation here that's developed over decades mm -hmm. so that the Defense Department budget is so enormous compared to any other federal budget agency. And given that fact, the Congress and other leaders have tended to push even congressionally directed programs into the military because they have the size and the scale of programs that can do this. As mm -hmm. for example, medical research, you'd think NIH would do a lot of the medical research that the US military does, a background that I have. So we're looking at the development of vaccines mm -hmm. or surgical techniques or fighting HIV AIDS. And the military paved the way for a lot of this, or the development mm -hmm. of technology. So we're looking at ARPA invented the internet, despite what our former vice president wants to claim. And uh, we push uh, studies on PTSD. We push studies on development of artificial limbs and treatment and surgery. Uh, 
120 countries, 140 countries, whatever it is, the civil affairs, the special forces are out there. They're doing work that presumably we could have USAID or other kinds of non-governmental agencies doing. And I think it's in part because the leadership and the Congress and the military find it the most convenient way to do that. The, the National mm -hmm. Guard has a lot of resources in 50 states, and so they fight the floods. And yeah. we send the military to tsunamis. Do you have some thoughts on uh, yeah. how do we get the balance back into <laughs> what it could be if we're not yeah. going to differentiate between combatants and right. civil servants who should be doing this? I don't think we're likely to get the balance back, frankly. And and I part company with, with many of my friends uh, in this town on this issue, I, I think it's sort of fashionable to say we need to rebalance. Um, certainly, it was during the Obama administration. I don't think President Trump is as interested in that, but but I think that the uh, senior leaders in the in the at the Pentagon continue to say we need to we need to restore the balance. Um, and I guess I would say two things about that. One of which, one is that I don't know what I don't know what it means to talk about the proper balance. There are some habits we have and some traditions about you do this, we do that. Um, but as I said, didn't come from a divine power. Um, I used to have arguments when I was at the Pentagon uh, with my colleagues at the State Department about things like information operations uh, issues and who should do what and you know why is the military doing this it should be art and I always felt a little impatient with that I always thought wait a minute um, who cares the point is that if the United States needs this to get done we need to figure out who can do it well who can do it who can, you know who can do it best and then we want to try to make sure that they do it well and they do it in a, in a responsible transparent accountable fashion and that's really all I care about I don't really care whether they're wearing uniforms or not when they do it so so number one I I have no particular I, I, I think we get way too hung up on the idea of, well but that's a civilian job or well that's a military job and partly that stems from the legal framework right I mean the, you know sometimes legally speaking with our current framework it matters a lot if you're a civilian CIA contractor who's involved in a drone strike well guess what you're now targetable um, maybe you don't want to be targetable in which case we should think about whether that's a smart thing to do but 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 a lot of the time it doesn't have any particular legal implications and and I don't really care. Um, but the other reason I, I, I think there's, you know, I don't, I don't, I lose, I, not that interested in the conversations about restoring the balance in addition to thinking that I don't know what that means, the sort of abstract right balance, is that I also think that even if, even if we think, well, the way we did it in 19, let's just say 1990, we're going to call that the, the right moment or something, or, or 1995 or 1985, or pick your, pick your year, you know, that that was the right balance and that's what we want to get back to. I think there is absolutely zero likelihood in our political lifetimes that Congress is going to suddenly get up in the morning and go, oh gosh, you know, we got to give more money and authorities back to the civilian side. Let's, let's get that done. It's, it's not going to happen, um, however much we might wish it would, which means, uh, you know, if I can make a obscure literary reference, uh, some of you probably had at some point in your careers, college careers, read uh, Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, you know, in which a whole bunch of people sit around and people say, well, what are you doing? Well, we're waiting for Godot. We should leave. We can't. Why not? We're waiting for Godot. But of course, Godot doesn't come and never will come. And that's the whole depressing point of this rather boring play. Um, but I, you know, I think on this, we're sort of waiting for Godot that people kept saying, well, you know, we in the military are doing all this stuff that we shouldn't have to do, but it's just temporary. We're waiting for the balance to be restored. And over at the State Department, everybody is saying, well, you know, it's really just very unfair and wrong. All these authorities and resources went to the military. Um, but, you know, we're not, we're going to just wait for the balance to be restored. It's, it's not going to happen. And once you accept that it's not going to happen, um, period, then I think you think about it in a very different way. Then I think you start, you ship, you have to shift to thinking about it, not as, well, let's restore the balance, but rather as what does the nation need? Who can do it best? Uh, and how do we make sure that they do it in a way that is consistent with our, with our values, which is to say accountable? Um, and once you start having that discussion, you know, and how do they do it well, then you're in a completely different conversation. Then you're in a conversation of, okay, if it turns out that we want the military to come up with vaccines or vaccinate cattle or do whatever it may be, how do we make sure they're good at it? How do we make sure that they have the right people, the right training, the right tools every step along the way? And, and I think that sometimes that pushes you in a very different direction than we're in right now. And I, I used to, I once got myself in hot water 
well, actually, I frequently get myself in hot water, writing a somewhat tongue-in-cheek column in which I suggested that if we were serious about wanting the U.S. military to do you know, governance support and economic development projects and so on, that the military should stop recruiting at American high schools and start recruiting at the annual AARP conference instead. <laughs> um, and everybody said, oh, that's ridiculous, you know, that's outrageous. And, and of course, I was sort of joking, but, but not completely, because if, if we think that, you know, if we think that the primary task of the U.S. military now and in the decades to come uh, is going to be, you know, ground combat, uh, well, then it's a really good idea to recruit a lot of 18 to 22-year-old males. Um, you know, they're strong, they've got great endurance, they can, you know, carry heavy stuff for long periods of time. If we think that one of the primary tasks of the U.S. military is going to be, you know, cyber, or we think it's going to be, you know, scientific or cultural and linguistic knowledge or, or economic development, well, guess what? You know, 18-year-old boys are not your target demographic. You know, you're going to do a lot better with different demographics, but we have a we have a recruiting system that, in all kinds of ways, is very rigid and very high bound, and and a personnel system that doesn't let us bring people in laterally very easily. It doesn't let us let people go out and acquire new skills. You know, so if we decide, if we change that conversation from how do we restore the balance to, okay, the military is going to be doing it. How do we make sure they do it well? Then I think you're having a, a really different conversation and one that we 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 actually desperately need to be having.